back to where we were looking just a few moments ago over in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 15 verses 22 through 27. Now as we move through the summer months we have a lot of interruptions and so we've been trying to get through the the ten different times that the Jews rebelled against God in their wilderness wanderings. I hope today we can finish the Rephidim test, test number four, where Israel rebelled against God. And at Rephidim, it's where we learned lessons about prayer and spiritual warfare. As a result, we have gone into different parts of the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament, to look at the warfare that we as believers today face. All the way back in May, we started looking at the fourfold division of the angelic military that Paul mentions in Ephesians chapter 6. He talks about how we wrestle against principalities and against powers and so on. And we saw that that first word, principalities, the arcade, the first ones, is used by Paul of angels and demons who are invested with power. On June the 3rd, we began the study of the second word, exousia. It's translated powers, but it means authorities or jurisdictions, areas in which the authority is exercised. We learned the seven key principles that are related to jurisdiction when we studied exousia. Then on June 10th, we began a study of authority in the New Testament, and we began with Romans chapter 13, very, very important passage for us as believers in this New Testament age. Romans 13, 1 through 3 is one of the most important passages in the New Testament, teaching why Christians should be in submission to civil government and civil authorities. In fact, in those three verses, we find exousia is used five different times. Paul writes, let every soul be subject to the higher powers, that's exousia, authorities. For there is no power, that's exousia, authorities, but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. That's exousia again. Paul is talking about authority. God has a very important word to say to us about authority because they're all under God. The areas of authority that God has given to government include only four things. Government tries to step outside of its authority. In fact, we find our current government often stepping outside its authority that was ordained by God. Governments all over the world have systematically abused the authority that they've had by God and have usurped authority that belongs to God himself. Governments that prohibit the worship of the true and living God are setting themselves up as God. All the communist governments have done that. Hitler's government did that. Every oppressive government sets itself up as God and requires worship of the great leader of that government. But that is not biblical authority. There are only four areas where God has given government authority. Number one, the civil and social order based upon the principles of divine law. Government must follow divine law. Civil and social order. Number two, criminal law and national defense. That is war, including capital punishment under criminal law. And Paul makes that clear in Romans 13, 4. The third area where government has authority is the establishment of a national moral conscience based on divine law in the context of Romans 2. Now, our government is currently establishing a national moral conscience, but it is a depraved national moral conscience. Our government is promoting wickedness. It's promoting wickedness at every level of government. I'm very thankful that at last we have a president who's standing against that. I'm very thankful that he has appointed at least one Supreme Court justice thus far that is standing in the right course. Pray for him as he appoints another Supreme Court justice. As that justice is vetted by our <coughs> Senate. Excuse me, my voice is going that God will cause a justice to be confirmed who will stand against the wickedness that currently rules in our land. So the third area of government has responsibility, according to Romans 13.5, 
is the establishment of a national moral conscience based on divine law. And the fourth area, the one that nobody likes to talk about, and everybody likes to avoid if they can, you better not evade it, you'll go to jail, but at least you can avoid it. That's legal, evading is not, is taxation. That is the responsibility of government, and it is an authority that is ordained by God. Romans 13, 6 through 8. Then on June 17th, we got out of that mode again, and we had Father's Day message, a wise son maketh the glad father. On June 24th, we continued our study of exousia and learned that it is also used to speak of the authority of darkness as opposed to the authority of light. And Paul talks about that, who has delivered us from the power, that is exousia, the power, the authority of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. According to Colossians chapter 1, we saw that Jesus breaks the power of darkness, accomplishes at least 10 things. It gives us an eternal inheritance with other believers. It brings us into the kingdom of God. It gives us redemption through the blood of Christ. It gives us forgiveness of sins. It gives us personal contact with the invisible God. It gives us personal contact with the creator God. It gives us personal contact with the head of the body. Three different titles that Jesus has given in that passage. It guarantees our eternal security because he holds all things together. It guarantees our resurrection. It puts all authority in its proper order. We saw that light contrasted with darkness is a major theme in scripture going back to the very beginning. And we see that in Genesis 1 and in John chapter 1 as well. That brought us to the next word describing the top levels of demonic divisions of authority. That's the word that Paul uses when he says rulers of the darkness of this world. That's cosmocrator. That's a compound word from the word world, cosmos, and dictator, krator. He is the world dictator, Satan is. One who uses violent strength to seize and retain his power. This is the only place in the entire New Testament that this word occurs and it refers to Satan and the highest demons immediately underneath him. Ephesians 6, 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We are in spiritual warfare. That is what that fourth test at Rephidim was all about, where Amalek attacked Israel. Israel didn't bother Amalek. Amalek came out and attacked them. And we saw that when Moses lifted his hands up, that beautiful symbol of prayer, as long as his hands were raised, Israel won. And when Moses' hands lowered, Israel lost. And so Joshua and her, or Aaron and Hur held up the hands of Moses while Joshua fought the battle in the valley below. And they held him steady until the going down of the sun. And Israel won. You cannot win the spiritual battle without prayer, without consistent prayer, without intercessory prayer, without passionate prayer, without continuous prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance for all saints. Prayer is the manner of life of the believer. And it is the only way you will win the battle. You must be guarded and armed with the spiritual armor that God has given to you. You must have the sword of the Spirit, but you must not forget prayer. Cosmocrator, you're wrestling against the one who uses violent strength to seize and to retain the world dictator, Satan. He's a strong man whom Jesus binds in Matthew and Mark. Only our Lord Jesus Christ is stronger than the strong man who is the violently strong dictator who rules the violent murderous forces of darkness. On July 1st, we celebrated Independence Day Sunday with a message entitled Freeborn. So that brings us till to today. And we look at the last area of wickedness that we are fighting against, which is listed there in that passage for us in Ephesians chapter 6. We wrestle against principalities, powers, rules of darkness, and the last one, it says, spiritual wickedness in high places. Spiritual wickedness in high places. That's the word panaria. 
from Paniros, a reference to all the host under the leadership of the echelons of power and authority of Satan that Paul has discussed. The focus of that word is on the, this, get this important, this very important, the focus of that word is on the moral decadence and the permeating evil of the character of the demonic host. They reflect the evil character of their leader who's called the evil one. Just as the holy angels reflect the righteous moral character of their leader, Jesus Christ, so the demons reflect the moral character of their leader, the evil one. Now, a lot of people don't understand the difference between evil and sin. Paneros is not merely sin. The word for sin is hamartia, or hamartia, missing the mark. It's the deliberate sin and attempt, instead, when we get to paneros, to defile the moral standards of God. Sin is when you don't do what God tells you to do, or you do what God tells you not to do. But paneros is where you're focused on rebellion against God. And that's the moral character of the devil. In fact, it's the central controlling immoral character, immoral character quality of Satan, just as holiness, and we've studied this, is the central controlling moral character of God. The word for wickedness or evil is the continuous wicked acting and expression of the totally depraved evil nature of Satan and his followers. Thus, in the context of what we're speaking of, in our spiritual warfare, we are not merely wrestling with good people whose ideas need to change. You cannot change by rational discussion that which by its very intrinsic nature is evil. God did not put you or me on a discussion panel with the goal of persuading people who are just confused. God gave you spiritual armor in Ephesians 6 and the sword of the Spirit, listen carefully, to do militant battle against evil. I think some of you don't get that. You sort of wishy-washy through life. You sort of try not to offend too many people as you sort of blend in with the crowd. That is not why God put you here. He didn't put you here to discuss things with other people and say, well, you've got a good point there, and you've got a good point there. Maybe you consider a few of my points, and they say, we don't consider your points at all. I say, well, but, but let's talk nicely. They say, don't you understand? We're about to kill you. You are dealing with those who are under the control of Satan. Only as you wear the spiritual armor and as you use the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, this is your only offensive weapon in fighting Satan and his forces. It is the only thing that can penetrate the heart of an unregenerate, lost man, woman, boy, or girl. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even through the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Dear people, this is not a discussion group. This is a war to the death. Did you get that? Not just a battle that's taking place someplace else. This is a war to the death, and it involves you as a soldier. The word for wickedness or evil is continuous wicked acting and expression of the totally depraved evil nature of Satan and his followers. You're not wrestling against good people who just need their ideas changed a little bit. You're in militant battle against evil. You see, God views Satan and his followers, both angelic and human, as decadent, defiled, and perversely evil. It is not a matter of being ignorant of what is good. It is the deliberate choice to rebel against God's moral standards and divinely revealed order. I hope you can see that in the modern perversions of sexuality that are surrounding us today. I put two different inserts into your bulletins today. One of those is very clearly perversion, 
Canada recognizes three people in polyamorous relationships as the parents of one child. And the judge in the case root in that he said it would not be in the child's best interest to deny parental recognition to both men, stating that when lawmakers passed the Children's Law Act of 1997, which only allows two parents to be named on a birth certificate, they didn't take into consideration the, quote, now complex family relationships that are common and accepted in our society. This is brand new. June 28th. Not even two weeks old yet. Do you understand, people, the kind of world that we're living in? There's another one in here, too. Hope you bother to read these things. The one that uh, talks about how uh, scientists are now attempting to figure out how to get men pregnant. Do we live in a perverse, perverted world, or what? You are in a war, whether you like it or not. And if you don't stand for the truth, evil will run over you like a bulldozer. Only the truth can stop evil. And that is what this world is. You know, there was another article that on the perversions of sexuality in government schools, they're called public schools, government schools that I wanted to put in today. But it was so graphic. It graphically discussed such vile moral practices that are taught even to kindergartners that I couldn't put it in today's Sunday Bulletin. But when I read it, I was so horrified. All over the country this last month, all over the country, there were parents who had children in public schools who were, who were protesting. I'll just give you a summary of it. I won't tell you what was going on. But who were protesting the so-called sex education that was being taught in the public schools that have been brought in by these left-wing, grotesquely immoral groups undercover, and nobody knew what was going on until somebody found out about it, and they pulled their kids out of school for a day. It was in protest against this curriculum that was going into the schools and was being taught in, in many different schools. And the point of the article, after describing some of the things which it made my hair turn white, I mean, I know it's already turning away, but I mean, I couldn't believe what was being taught to little children to do and encouraging them to do it. First graders, second graders, third graders. And so parents pulled their kids out for a day. The article was saying, pull your kids out and never send them back. Never send them back. You do not want that kind of perversion taught to your children. Your kids should either be homeschooled or in Christian schools, not in government schools. They are teaching the philosophy of Satan, of evil, of the evil one. Decadent, depraved, immorality. If you want a copy of that article, I'll be happy to give it to you as an adult. But it did not go in the bulletin. That is why this church has always stood for militant fundamentalism. We know that we are in a spiritual war. We know that God has called us to do battle. If you are not actually fighting the battle, you are a disobedient soldier and you will pay for it. There are only two options. Either you are engaged in the fight or you are being deceived and lulled to sleep by the devil so that he can destroy you. Ephesians 6, remember it? Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins good about with truth, having the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance. You hang in there, don't give up. And supplication for all saints. And for me. Paul wanted prayer requests. You know, people praying for him. Why? Because he was in the battle. Do you think 
that the devil attacked Paul harder than some lazy, drunken Christian who was lying around at home fiddling with junk. It's the soldiers who are in the war that need prayer. Pray for me. Pray for those who are in the war and give in the war yourself. That utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak freely as I ought to speak. Dear people, we don't live in a world that's full of good people and it has a few bad people. We don't live in a world that's got lots of good people and lots of bad people. We don't live in a world that has, well, maybe 75% bad people, but the rest of them are really good. They're do going around doing nice things like feeding poor people and stuff like that. That's not good from God's perspective because it's not for his glory. It's not in obedience to the word of God. It's not in the power of the Holy Spirit. Those things are necessary for something to be a good work. An unsaved man cannot do a good work in the sight of God. Isaiah makes that very clear. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. The word he uses is menstruous cloth. That's the good works. What do you think he thinks about the bad works? That's what God says about your good works if you're not saved. They stink. No, you're in a world where all the apparent goodness is actually motivated by evil. I'll give you some verses on that in just a second. But you need to understand that there are only two classes of people in the world. There are those who are saved and there are those who are lost. And the lost are under the control of Satan. They're not good. And the Bible makes that very clear. The Bible makes it clear that the entire world and the entire world system is evil and under Satan's control, who is called the evil one. Let me prove it to you. This is over in 1 John chapter 5, beginning in verse 16. And he talks about a bunch of different things here. He talks about sin. He talks about sin unto death. He talks about sins that are not sins unto death. There are certain things which if a believer does it, God is going to kill him and take him home. That's sin unto death. So we start there, but then he begins to talk about how there's also the world around us that's not just involved in sin, it's involved in evil. I'll begin reading in verse 16, 1 John 5. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. So you're praying for a brother, you're praying for another Christian, he's sinned. He looks like he's on his way out, but you pray for him because it was not a sin unto death. And we've talked about the sin unto death in the past. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. So you don't pray for somebody who's committed the sin unto death. Verse 17, all unrighteousness is sin. So you can't just say, well, the only sin is sin unto death. No, all unrighteousness is sin. There is a sin that's not unto death. Now let's look at verses 18 and following, 18 and 19 especially. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. That's habitual present there. He doesn't continue to sin. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Now that's a reference to the devil. The wicked one, the poneros, the poneria, toucheth him not. Verse 19. Here's how God views the rest of the world. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Not most of the world, not 75% of the world, not 99% of the world. The whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. So here's the world is in the wicked one. Here are the believers, they're in Jesus Christ. Two categories, only two categories. No halfway house. 
Either you're in Christ, that's verse 20, or you're in the wicked one. The whole world lieth in wickedness. In other words, they're under the control of the wicked one who is mentioned in the preceding verse. That wicked one toucheth him not. Those are the believers. But the whole world lies in the wicked one. But we are in Jesus. Even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is true God and eternal life. The whole world lieth in wickedness under the control of the wicked one in the preceding verse. And they love it. They're not struggling to get out. Did that ever occur to you? They are not struggling to get out. Just like you are in Christ and you're not struggling to get out. They are in the wicked one and they are not struggling to get out. Think of it this way. <clears throat> Imagine that you've had a hard day of working outside in the bitter cold. Think about winter. We're in summer right now, but, but think about winter. You've had a hard day working outside in the bitter of cold. You're wet. You're miserable. You finally get home. You shake the wet snow off, and then you fill up your jacuzzi with warm water and bubble bath. Oh, man. You settle in. The water is up to your chin. You let out a sigh of relief. You love it. You drift off to sleep as you relax. Do you get the picture? That's what John is talking about when he says that the whole world lieth in wickedness. They are soaking it up. They love it. It makes them feel good. If you come up to that person and you start preaching against their wickedness, they say, oh, I guess I'll get out of the tub. No. They get violently angry. They try to shut you up. You're taking away the evil pleasures that they love the most. From their perspective, you've just drained the jacuzzi and poured in ice water. But they don't know that something else is about to happen. Years ago, I saw a film about a Russian leader who thought he had everything under control. And at one point in the film, toward the end, he was sitting in a hot tub just like we've discussed. I mean, literally, sitting in a hot tub with bubble bath up to his chin. And he was enjoying it very much. He had behind him this powerful masseuse who was massaging his shoulders as he soaked in the pleasant warmth. The phone rang. He picked it up. It was one of his enemies who told him that he was about to be killed. As he's looking at the phone, suddenly the masseuse put his arm around the Russian leader's neck and strangled him, shoving him under the water. That, people, is what the devil is doing to the whole world who lieth in wickedness. This evil that they love and they soak it up and it gives them pleasure and they're getting their massage and they don't realize that they're about to get the arm around the neck and get strangled and shoved under the water. I hope as we've discussed the spiritual warfare in which you and I are involved which is the picture of Rephidim and Amalek and Israel involved in warfare that you have on your whole armor, that you have up the shield of faith, that you are actively using the sword of the Spirit, that you are engaged in battle because the whole world lies in wickedness. They support it. They say, well, maybe I'm not homosexual, but you know, we'll let them have their rights after all. 
Well, all these transgenders, yeah, well, I don't understand that, but it was, hey, it's good. Let live and let live. Dear people, the whole world lieth in wickedness. And Paul says we're wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. Oh, dear people, either you're involved in battle as a militant fundamentalist, or else you are being deceived and lulled to sleep in that hot tub with your massage and bubble bath until suddenly you're drowned. Don't let it happen. Obey your commander in chief. The devil is the masseuse. It all seems so pleasant until he kills you. Our time is up. But let me just mention a couple of other points. I have quite a few pages yet left. Religious leaders can be wicked. Not just religious leaders sin. Everybody sins. They can be wicked. They can be evil. That was very clear from the Lord Jesus Christ dealing with the Pharisees, for example. Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? And that word translated wickedness is paneria. It is wickedness. It is evil. They looked so good. They held religious services. They dressed up at their religious services. They went around and told people to keep the law of God. They tied their mint and anise and cumin. All the little stuff. But Jesus said he perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? They were challenging him. Should we pay tax or should we not pay tax? <laughs> of course, Romans 13 hadn't been written yet, so Jesus didn't quote Romans chapter 13. But instead, Jesus said, Show me a penny. And they gave him a penny. And he said, Whose image and superscription is on this penny? Now, this is not a Roman penny. This is an American penny. <laughs> Whose image and superscription is on this? They said, Caesar's. Like, duh, any idiot can answer that. Duh, Caesar's. Oh, Caesar minted this money, huh? Yeah. Um, Caesar had the metal that he melted down and melt, made this money out of. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And that's his picture on there, right? Yeah. And you trade with this money, right? Yeah. Render, therefore, to Caesar that which is Caesar's and to God that which is God's. And they couldn't say a word. Government has the right to tax. That's number four of the four legitimate activities of government that we discussed in Romans chapter 13. In fact, Paul spends three verses on that. But their motive, their intent, their heart was evil. They were trying to challenge the very Son of God, God himself come in flesh on earth when they asked him that question. Oh, there are other passages. Lord willing, maybe we'll pick those up last next week. But that essentially completes our study of Rephidim, the wilderness test number four. Rephidim was when God tested Israel how to do spiritual warfare and the necessity of prayer. I know that you've learned through our study that the principles God is teaching from Israel's war with Amalek are the same principles that we must use today. If we fail this test, we will also die in the wilderness as Israel did. The tests that God gave to Israel were designed to teach the church by example. 1 Corinthians 10, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. He's talking about the Exodus. What are we studying in, in the book of Exodus? We're studying the Exodus. So he's saying, okay, I want you to pay attention to what happened in the Exodus. They all ate the same spiritual meat. They all did drink the same spiritual drink. They drank of the, uh, the spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ. 
But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. People, it can happen here. You say, well, but, I mean, what does that have to do with me? Very next verse. Now, these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And then he gives a whole different list, five different things there that he talks about, five different categories of sins into which believers fall. Verse 11, he tells you again. Now, all of these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Moses, 1400 B.C. Folks, how many years ago is that? Almost 3,500 years ago. Do you know why that stuff happened to them? Because of you sitting here at Collingswood Bible Presbyterian Church today. That happened to them for you. That's what Paul says. These happened to them for examples that are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Israel went through those tests to teach you a lesson. Israel went through those failures to teach you a lesson. Whenever Israel had a success, that was to teach you a lesson so that you would not fall into the same problems that they had. <clears throat> Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And then Paul gives us a verse that has, I've sat on this verse so many times, I can't believe it. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. God guarantees it. You're only going to face common temptations. That's why those things happened to Israel in the Old Testament, because you're going to face the same kind of temptations that they faced. And you see how they failed and what happened to them, and a word to the wise, unless your brains are sitting, you know, in bed someplace, that's so that you won't do the same thing. Let's talk about <clears throat> America and the example that it is for America. Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them unto chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, so angels rebelled. What did God do? He nailed them. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So what did God do when the whole world went bad? <laughs> Remember the whole world, life and wickedness. Folks, we are sitting on the cusp of judgment. God destroyed the world with a flood. And fire is coming, and he's going to burn up the whole earth someday. But now listen to the third example. Because this is the one that clearly applies to America. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow. Now get this. This is where he attaches that phrase that we saw back in 1 Corinthians 10. Making them, that is Sodom and Gomorrah, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. Hello, America. Are you listening, America? God gave you Sodom and Gomorrah as an example of what God is going to do to you. Are you listening, America? To make sure we don't miss the point, though the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was an example for us today, God repeats it in the epistle of Jude. Jude, verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, there were five cities of the plain, four of them were overthrown, one was spared, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, set forth for an example. You say, well, yeah, but they just burned them up. No, no, no. It goes farther than that. Listen to the last phrase in Jude 7. Suffering the vengeance of eternal 
fire. People, if you don't stand up and be counted on these issues, you're like Israel losing the battle. You are in a spiritual war. When you Mickey Mouse and fiddle around and pussyfoot and refuse to take a stand on moral issues, which God has clearly defined in his word, you are destroying your country and you are destroying the church and you are destroying the testimony of Christ and you are losing the battle. It is a war. Either you are armed with all of your armor, including the sword, and pray in the power of the Spirit of God without ceasing, pray without ceasing, not the shortest verse, but one of the shortest verses in the Bible, very pointed. If you're not doing that, you're in the hot tub filled with bubble bath, relaxing, enjoying, being lulled to sleep until the message comes. You're about to be killed. Rephidim. Are you engaged in the battle? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. O oh, Father, we are slothful soldiers, we confess it. We're not always wearing the armor because it's gotten a little hot. We've let our sword sit to the side while we read the newspaper. We've let the sword get rusty. We hear the pleasant music wafting in from the world. We taste the wine of the world. We soak in the bubble bath of the world. And know not that it is for destruction. The whole world lieth in wickedness, in the wicked one. We're in Christ. Why would we lie in wickedness with the world? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll take the word of God as proclaimed this day and apply it to our hearts. That where there is sin, you would cause us to confess it. But where there is evil, that we might run from it, that we might flee from it, that we might put on all of our armor, that we might fight with all of our, all of our strength and soul and might. And the power of your spirit to the glory of Jesus Christ, your son, our commander-in-chief, in whose name we pray. Amen.